I want us to pray again one more time, all right? Can we do that? And as we bow, I want you to think about the people you just met. Just maybe consciously for a moment, think about the person who's next to you or in front of you, behind you. Get them in your mind, all right? And let me just guide you through prayer. Father, help us pray for the people around us right now. The couple or the family or the individual. They look pretty normal. But, and they might, they might be, but there's also aches and burdens and fears and concerns. Help us to lift them up to you right now. Would you help us, Father, um, be aware of the community in which we've been placed here? There are bigger ones and smaller ones and younger ones and older ones, and there are all kinds of different ones, but this is the one we're a part of right now. For those who are watching at home, there's a, maybe a little community around there, or they're a part of this community here, and they just couldn't um, find the drive to get out this morning when it's so cold, but I pray that we will be aware of each other to be humbly aware of each other. And we ask you to humbly guide us to be your instrument in blessing or caring for, or praying for those. Help us be your, and live out your example in how we receive their care for us. And would you show us more and more how to live with each other. Bless us as we open your word, as we open your this time of teaching. I pray you will guide our hearts to submit to you and follow you as you lead. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, if you're an American, especially one who's from uh, the proud state of North Dakota, chances are you've been taught something um, all your life that's not completely true. Some of it is, but you've been taught the monumental merits of independence. Starting at me as a boy going to Pioneer School, I, I, it was impressed upon me that to be independent is to be free. It means to be a self-starter, to have self-determination and self-reliance and sufficient resources, or at least the intent to find sufficient resources to, to, to get life done in my life. I, there are, these are admirable qualities for all of us. They really are. And to be an independent nation... I mean, this is really key. It means that no other nation tells us what to do. No other nation has to fix us, right? Not the Brits, not the French, not the Chinese, certainly not the Canadians, right? To be American is to be independent and proud and autonomous, and we will fight anyone who tries to diminish the virtue we have of independence. And the trouble is there are a lot of self-made, self-sufficient, independent people who have in their autonomy... They've grown accustomed to living unconnected, living life detached, living outside the influence of others. We stand up on our own two feet. We pay our own way, and that's virtuous. But it also means there are times that we stand alone. When you read the story of God creating the universe, he, he gave a constant refrain as he thought about as he reviewed what his hands had made and he kept on announcing it is good the stars the sun the moon good 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 right oceans mountains seas good plants birds dogs very good very good poison ivy brussels sprouts cats yeah. no all very good you know the first time god said something was not good it's when he noticed the man he created, Adam. He was alone. And the first time God said, it is not good. This is not good. It's not good for my people to be alone. So God created Eve, and that's awesome. But it's not just about marriage. You need to understand that when it says this in Genesis 2. You can be single and complete. Alone means being unconnected. That's why God instituted family and friendships, and laid out the plans for relationships, and, and teams, and church, so we never have to be alone. We were created to live in this thing called community. It's been God's plan from the, from the very beginning. 
most of us know we've had challenges where we felt very much alone. We, we've had that experience. Sometimes we find ourselves isolated because of circumstances. It, not our doing, it just happens. I, I often think about this. I really do. Our family moved from, from Calgary, Alberta, Canada to Detroit um, when our uh, boys were still in high school or middle school. And um, we moved in January of my oldest son's senior year. His name is Tyler. And because Tyler would be graduating in a few months, we gave him an option when we moved. We said, you can come to Detroit uh, with us, and there's a great school there. And make that the last semester of your high school career, and you can graduate there. Or you can stay in Calgary. We have some great friends who would love to have you stay with them and uh, move to Detroit afterwards in May when, when school is over. And he chose to stay. He never complained about it. He didn't. It was 20 years ago. But now, as he looks back, the most pressing thought on his mind when he thinks about that era is that he felt abandoned. He felt alone. My middle son, named Eric, uh, it was, he was a sophomore when we moved, and staying was not an option for him. He moved with us, of course, and he, he went to this new school that was so great, but he didn't know anyone, and he, he kind of was looking forward to the challenge in some ways, but we didn't find this out till months afterwards, but, but the part of being new in this school, as he was a a sophomore student starting in January of this new year, is that he hated the lunch hour because he would sit by himself having lunch. No one would sit with him. He didn't know anybody. And he hated staring at these seven empty seats at a table around him while everyone else had people. So after a week or so of this, he tried something new. He'd get his lunch, and then he'd find an empty stall in the men's room. He'd close the door and eat lunch sitting on the toilet. Circum circumstances prompted all that, not my son. And when we learned, when Holly and I learned, it just killed us. And you might hear that and think, oh, that would be awful. Yeah. So we, we can imagine what that would feel like. We'd imagine the, the taste of that, the feeling of that. Some intentionally choose to do life on their own. Some circumstances happen to us. But independence in life is not our goal interdependence is, to care about others and to be cared for. To, we're made to serve others and from time to time to be served. We're made to love and be loved. We were made by our creator for community. Romans chapter 12, verse 5. We're starting this new series today, and this is a, a foundational text for this series. Uh, it says this, Romans 12, verse 5. says, since we are all one body in Christ, we belong to each other. And each of us needs all the others. We belong to to each other. First Corinthians 12, verse 26, it says, if one member suffers, like my boys or my wife or like her friend who texted her the other night and said, you know, after a challenging couple of days, are you available for a hug tonight? If one member suffers, even just a little bit, we all suffer together. If one member is honored, we all rejoice together. You are the body of Christ, it says. You are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Okay, that, what I've just shared, those couple minutes, that's the foundation for the series we're starting today, a major series called Better Together. It's going to be what we teach you on for the next eight weeks, centered on the fact that we, we really can't be the person God wants to be by ourselves. We can't. It's impossible. God wired all of us in such a way that we can only fulfill his design his purpose for our lives, when we're engaged in meaningful, meaningful relationships with others. And if you're the highly independent source, and I get that, I, I tend to be independent. I tend to be kind of an introvert, a gregarious introvert, but still I get a lot of energy just being alone. If you tend to be that, this might be a bit challenging for you from time to time. But engaging with others is so important, even though it's uncomfortable. Let me promise you, on the strength of God's word and God's design, the more you engage with the people around you in this very room or people from this church family who are watching online on this brutally cold day, the greater our connection, the more we'll be able to overcome things like fear or fatigue or loneliness or failure or frustration, despair. The antidote to so much we go through, the, the ministry that comes to us and so much what we go through is found in this concept of community. The more, the more connected we are with others in the body of Christ, the greater the impact of our contribution as well in representing Jesus to our world. The more connection we have, the more we'll encounter the privilege of impacting, impacting other lives, and that privilege will nurture your soul and encourage your heart 
in all kinds of ways. So the time that remains, I'm going to explain just a little bit about what we're going to be doing for the next two months. And I'm going to introduce this uh, Better Together series, series simply by giving you five reasons why we need each other, why you need a church family. And more than that, five reasons why you need to be connected to a few other friends who get to know you on a level that goes beyond casual acquaintances. Five reasons the Bible provides why we need each other. I first did a series like that like 20 years ago, Saddleback, out in California Church. They did, they did this kind of a project called... 40 days of community, and, and we just feel that right now, given the way, place of our world and where we've been and where churches are, it's very important to think about some of these concepts. So we're going to talk about them just a little bit, okay? First, first reason why we need others. I need others to walk with me. I need others to walk with me. The Bible often refers to our spiritual walk, our spiritual life. It describes it as a walk. Colossians 2, verse 6, just as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. So we call our faith journey the Christian walk or the spiritual walk. And as you read through the New Testament, you read that there, we're to walk in the light, we're to walk in love, we're to walk in obedience, we're to walk in the Holy Spirit, we're to walk as Jesus walked, we're to walk in wisdom. But as you walk along those paths that God's described, it's very clear he never intended for us to walk through life, including your spiritual life, alone. We all need other people to walk with us. So for our benefit. God created, gave us two kinds of groups. He gave us a physical family and a spiritual family. Our physical or biological family, uh, for many of us, make up our primary relationship circles. It's a good thing. But we're not always on the same page with family. We're not always present with family. A lot of you are in families where there's a great deal of spiritual diversity, a great deal of distance. I did a call yesterday with someone who died, and and. and I wanted to call his family. His daughter died, 41-year-old daughter. Her dad was there. And he had one other daughter that he had he's seen once in his life. And she said, why not? And now he said, he's, he's got nothing. Because he's not connected with her. He's got grandkids. He doesn't know. And I, it, that's an odd family. It, it, it is. But the aloneness of that. We were made to have biological and spiritual family. First 30 years of our married life, Holly and I lived a long ways away from our family. This is the first place we've lived in our married life where we actually had family close. It's a great thing, but sometimes we're not close at all. Even if some of you are surrounded by family, like Dan, Dan's got a lot of, you can't open your car door in the mall parking lot without bumping into a Weigel. You just can't. It happens all the time, all right? And even if you're surrounded by biological family, we need a church family, one that goes beyond Family traditions are habits and so. That's God's safety net for us. Hebrews 10 says, let us not give up the habit. It means something you do all the time. Let's not give up the habit of meeting together. Instead, encourage each other. Let us warn each other. We need, I need people to encourage me in my daily walk. And that can't happen. No one will help with that. No one will encourage or warn me of dangers ahead unless I'm regularly meeting together with my spiritual family. In that verse, Hebrews 10 it's not talking just about what we're doing right here, coming to church here, as important as that is. What's going on in this room is essential, it's great, it's, it's healthy, but it really isn't community. This is a crowd, a small one today, but it's a crowd. We come here to worship, to serve, to bring friends, to learn, to be part of something that's God's movement in our world. And afterwards, some of you are going to visit the lobby for a while, but others of you are going to leave right away. You go to Costco, right? You're going to go home. What we do in a group this size is not community. Community is what happens when you're with three or five or eight other people sitting in a circle, relating, sharing with one another. You could be in a crowd at church every week for years and still be disconnected, still feel alone, still be alone, lonely, because you never really get to know anybody. We need a place in our lives where more goes on. We need a place, a group where we can practice relationship building and really learn to love and accept and grow and encourage. And even if you're here every week and you exchange smiles and handshakes with the nursery volunteer or the greeter at the door or people in here, that's not community. You need a small group of believers. I need a small group of believers with whom I can walk through life. And that's the goal. Ephesians uh, 4 verse 16 says, as each part does his work, referring to all of us, the body of Christ, to, it helps other parts grow. So Christ's whole body, the church, is healthy and growing and full of love. That's what God wants. We really believe that here. Especially with the division we've been through the last number of years. Especially with the isolation of COVID. That's still affecting us. 
So we're going to push through this a little bit because I think it's so important. If you're not connected to others in a small group setting of some kind, I'm asking you just to give it a try in the next few months. To put this scriptural concept into practice for, 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 for just six weeks. Get in a group and go six times. That's all I've asked you to do. If you've never been to a small group experience, it might seem odd to you, but it's really not that odd. It, it will pass very quickly. You just sit around for a while having some small talk. Then we're going to have a video. The host of your group will show a little video, 20 minutes long or so, about how to deepen our relationships. And after the video, the group is going to discuss a little bit, talk about what you've learned. Some will close in prayer. You won't have to pray if you don't want to. There'll be some snacks. You'll go home. You might be reluctant to try it, but there's simply no downside to giving these kind of groups a try. Worst case, they will serve snacks you don't like. Big deal. More likely case, you'll hear something that will build you up. You'll meet some new friends who will encourage your spiritual walk or you theirs. You'll see these people then following on Sunday mornings afterwards and the weeks that follow, and you'll feel a bit more like you belong here. And God will bless you. That's a huge upside. So we're in process right now of trying to enlist, I know, 12 or 15 people who will be willing to host a group in their homes. And we'll talk about more of that in the days ahead. And, and we're going to train them, and we're going to help them figure out how to do it. And they're going to invite you, the rest of you, into your home. You can sign up if you want. We'll help you find a place. But if you want to sign up for a group, do that. But we also just want to find people who will lead. We'll make sure it happens for you. One reason we need community is we need people who will walk through life with us. Right? Now, second thing, I need others not just to walk with me, but to work with me. Ephesians 2.10, God made us to do good works, which he planned and advice for us to do. This is a fascinating verse, really. It teaches that before you were even born, God, God um, invested something in you. He, he planned in advance something you would get, an ability, natural abilities or a spiritual gift that you could call something you could call your ministry. Anytime you use the talents God has given you to help other people, that's called a ministry or a service, and, and, and it, it's helpful to other people. Very few of us need to do the work God has planned for us alone, though. Ecclesiastes 4 said two people are better than one. We know that because they get more done by working together. It's so basic, but it's so true in the realm of doing life and ministry in God's kingdom. Now, I'm not sure you've noticed, but these days um, around our church, we've been taking on some very big projects. We showed you the, the whole roof thing being uh, built uh, last week uh, in, in Parhita in Romania. And there's some great things happening at Pioneer. There's some great things happening on Solon. We're caring for some homeless people that you don't even know about. There's children and youth initiatives that are taking place. And there are some also some, uh, the word I learned long ago, some BHAG, some big, hairy, audacious goals that are a bit of a dream for us. And I, I can't involve myself in all these, not at all. I can't, I can't take anyone on myself. I'm not strong enough to do them all. I'm just a little snowflake, right, in some respects. But the power of snowflakes, snowflakes are tiny, they're frail, but if enough of them get together, you can stop traffic with them, right? Get enough snowflakes together, they can do something. And in this church, we've got, I don't know, a couple hundred snowflakes. They'll stop something. Or better yet, it'll, it'll start something. We talked about this um, with a group of us here um, a little while ago. There's a church I learned about when we lived in Detroit. Uh, it's in, actually in Chicago. It's located right near Midway Airport, which is kind of a real kind of depressed part of the city. It's a little tar Parkdale church about this size. Uh, it's called Parkdale. Uh, they, they decided they wanted to be more impactful in their community. And so they took a survey, and they asked people in their community, what is it you want different in, your, in our neighborhood? Three things came out. We want a laundromat. There was no laundromat for miles and miles away. Second thing that was, came out in the survey, it's a dangerous, we want more security. If we could, if we could choose anything, we'd like more security. And the third thing is, we need access to medical care. A lot of people around us don't have insurance or they're underinsured. And besides that, clinics are a long time, ways away. So it's three things they did the survey all over the community. Three things they wanted, laundromat, security, and health care. And so this church, this a, just average church, started praying about that. And they bought some washers and dryers, some used ones, and found an old uh, building they could rent for very cheap. And they put these laundry machines in. They didn't have the cash boxes. They just put someone there to kind of collect some money and provide some, some detergent. And so and they started a laundromat. People came there and started getting their clothes done. And they also, some people in this little church said, we're going to make this neighborhood safer. Just, you know, four or five, eight block square area. 
we're going to patrol every night. We're going to make this the safest neighborhood in our part of the city. And they did. You know, neighborhood watch stuff and all that. And they found a doctor who's willing to come as he got out of medical school and to spend the first year of in as internship serving the medical needs of this little neighborhood. And they found something called an FQHC, uh, a way of funding this, a federally qualified healthcare center. There are federal dollars available. They still are. And they use those federal dollars to pay this physician. He gave one year, and he served 40. He just retired recently. And they started with a second doctor, and they were federally funded, and they started caring for people. And they found a little, little storefront that had two doctor's offices. And they expanded it more and more. And when we went to visit it about 10 years ago, they had 400 people on staff. This big clinic building, five stories high. They had women's health care, pediatric health care, wellness care. They dealt with allergies. They dealt with diabetes. Nurses and doctors and x-rays and lab work and uh, pharmacy. And it didn't cost the church a dime. It's all federally funded. All federally funded. And all they had to do was that. Their, their mission was to serve people with the love of Jesus in the medical area. And they couldn't make that a requirement uh, that you had to be a Christian to work there. They just said, what experience have you had reflecting Christ to your community? And people came forward, and it's an amazing ministry. When we were in Detroit, that little idea took shape. It was a 3 o'clock on a Thursday afternoon. And, and our, our church there ended up giving a building over to become a federal qualified health center. And about $2 million was raised to renovate it. And seven physicians and about 10 dentists in this it's amazing facility that's offering health care to the uninsured or underinsured in their community. Because people just had an idea and started working together and bringing together various gifts. Here, I, I don't know what we're supposed to do here next in our community. What I do know is when I meet people in the, in, in, in the city and it, it, I tell them what church I'm at, they say, oh, I know that church. You know what we're famous for? So many people. They learned to cut donuts in, the, in, the, in our parking lot in the wintertime. Right? That's where I learned, because our lot is square without, without parking blocks and, all, and trees and stuff that maybe technically we were supposed to have. Which, but people come and learn, they cut donuts. How many of you have done that in our parking lot? Yeah. Uh, yeah. You, uh, I like how proud you are. Yeah. It's... Uh, Matt, have you? Have you, Matt? Okay. I do it all the time. <laughs> you know? And that's, our, that's what we're famous for. That's, 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 that's okay. Wouldn't it be amazing if there was something more? Again, I've not even told our, our, our deacons about this, so, and I'm not pitching this as we should do this. But this idea came to us as a staff here uh, after we received an email from Aaliyah. Uh, used to be on our staff uh, about, I don't know, two months ago or so. There's this, little, there's this little gap in the, in the, the health care and, and, and uh, uh, social care for children. Sometimes in the middle of the night, a family blows up and there's violence or there's someone arrested or there's some very bad thing happens and these kids are, need to be removed from the home or they want to be removed to be safe. They, they, maybe their, their parents are arrested and these kids have to have a place to go. Now, we have a foster care system. We have a sheltering system to some degree, but it takes a while to, to find the right resource. And what's especially difficult was when a child is between 8, 9, 10, up to 17 years old. When a child has to be removed from a home in the middle of the night, there's no place to put them. And so the office in which Aaliyah works, it's a, it's a Burley County office that does, does uh, uh, health care for or social care for children. They end up bringing those kids to their office. And one of their staff has to come in and spend the night in the office. And they have a cot in the back room and the, the child sleeps in the cot. And they stay there for two or three days. That's awful. It's better than being in the home and all that, but it's awful. They have no place to take them. We used to have a place in Bismarck. We don't. There's one in Dickinson. There's one in uh, Fargo. There's one in Minot. But we don't have what's called a certified shelter care system in Bismarck. And so we're just thinking, I wonder if we can do this. And we're looking at this, this lot. And we have a garage across the parking lot where we keep the vans and stuff like that, and the lot next to it is sitting over here. That lot has been part of this church property since 1965. And all we've done with it is mow it. We have mowed it for 50 years. 58. Okay, do the math, because you're not to concentrate. How many years? 59, close, okay. 
We mowed it for 59 years. That's all we've done with this lot. We mowed it. We stacked some snow on it so people could cut cookies in our parking lot. And we wonder, and I, again, I'm not sure this is the right idea. I have no idea. We're still just praying about it. But what if we raise some funds, even outside the church, to build a, a place that has four or five bedrooms that's safe and warm and quiet and peaceful? If we train up some people, the county would pay for the funding to run the program and just have a place where kids can be brought and loved on and cared for. It's a little niche. What if we could, in the process of that, uh, build a youth center? We could say, hey, hey, guys, you've been here for a couple days now. You know, Wednesday night we're having a big youth activity here. We're going to play games and we're going to sit on a fire. We're going to talk and we're going to sing. You're going to have an experience to meet some other people in the neighborhood. And we offer it to the neighborhood. This is a very relatively poor neighborhood around us. What if we had things in there? We, we don't have enough room in this building anymore on Wednesday nights. The kids meet in here, and that's great for worship, but it's, the, the, the facility is packed on Wednesday night. What if we had a place that they could just, be, just have a gathering spot for them? Hey, there could be a different reputation for this place for years to come. But it will only happen. Things like that will only happen when we work together. I can't do that. I can't fund that. I can't manage that. I can't staff that. But could we? I, maybe. Galatians 6, verse 10, every time we get the chance, let us work for the benefit of all, starting with the people close to us in the community of faith. That's the church. I need people to walk with me. I need people to work with me. Third area, I need in life others who watch out for me. You do too. I need people who will defend me and protect me and stand up for me. I need people who will keep me on track, who will warn me. Philippians 2, verse 4 says, look out for others' interests, not just the interests of yourself. If you're like me, when you go on vacation, you'll oftentimes, we all, all of us, will go to the neighbors. If we live next door to someone, we'll go to the neighbors and tell them, you know, I'm going to be gone for a week or two, whatever it is. Would you keep an eye on my house? Right, just let's watch out. Would you mind looking out for my stuff while I'm away? Well, let me ask. Do you have someone look out for your soul? Not just when you're on vacation. Your soul is so much more important than your stuff. Have you given other people permission? Have you asked anyone to watch out for you, keep an eye out for you, the things that might hurt you? Holly and I know a family. They, they, they're, they're, have a lot of resources, right? They're, they're, they're quite wealthy. They never lock their home, ever. They never lock their cars. They go away, their house is standing there with the doors standing open because someone's coming to feed the dog kind of thing. But also because they don't have a clue where the key is. They don't know where their house key is. If they locked it, they wouldn't be able to get back in. Their door hasn't been locked in years. But this family, I think they have a pretty good perspective because while they're a little casual about home security, they're very diligent about what goes on inside them. And if you're asking other people to check on your stuff, how much more should we ask people to check on our motives or or examine the impact of accountability, respond to the counsel uh, of others because they know just how much is at stake in this world. And it has nothing to do with TVs and clothes and things we might have in our homes. We should be very concerned, more concerned about teaming up with others on soul matters. Is there anyone out there who's, who's teaming up with you on your spiritual journey? Who's watching out to make sure you're still growing? Who's, who's making sure that you're not getting discouraged or overwhelmed or depressed? We all have blind spots. If you have a taillight out in your car, will you know it? Now, some of us, our car's going to let us know, but normally someone's just going to tell you you've got a taillight out. We don't always see everything around us. Some of us arrive here on Sunday mornings unzipped, right? That ever happened to you? It's happened to me. It's a terrible thing when you're up here. If I'm ever unzipped, would you tell me about it? And don't mess around. Don't be out there in the sermon going, mm, because then I'll freak out. You know, but if I'm unzipped, if I have a little schmutz in my mouth, if I have broccoli between my tell me. We, we want to know, right? We want to know. I need others to watch out for me in bigger areas. Hebrews 13, keep being concerned about each other as the Lord's followers should. People in the church ought to take care of people around them. Be concerned about another. Stay vigilant. Because there's some serious consequences. Our enemy, Scripture tells us, is prowling around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he might devour. 
And if it's your turn, if the, the enemy has you in his sights, he's plotting to get you angry or get you impatient or lust-filled or, or worried or fearful, he plots ways of getting you depressed. Too often he succeeds in pulling us off track because we try to fight it on our own, by ourselves. Ecclesiastes 4, a person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two stand back to back and conquer. Three, even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. That's why we need each other in small groups. We just do. I played um, baseball and softball for years until I got old a little while back. But, but just before that happened, I was playing in a tournament, uh, and, and, and my, my, on my softball team, I was pitching, and, and our team was out in the field, and a ball was hit to the outfield, and I ran back to, to back up the throat of the plate that was going to be coming in, I thought, and this huge guy, about 275, six foot six, just muscular guy, big guy, instead of sliding into home, uh, when the ball got there, he did what he just kind of impulsively happened to him. He bowled over, he knocked our catcher into another country. And the catcher flew back and hit his head on the ground, and he was just laying there kind of stunned. It was a real dirty play. It was right in front of me. And I haven't done anything like this since high school, but when that big guy knocked over our catcher, something just kind of snapped inside. Something had to be done, and I was closest by, so I grabbed this big guy, and I shoved him back, and I yelled at him, and, and he was huge. And he was so lucky that he didn't try and swing at me because he would have killed me, right? <laughs> he would have killed me. I'm just standing up for my catcher. Now, the guy apologized right away, and I really wasn't all that enraged, but cooler heads prevailed. But what made me real brave in that moment when I stood up to this big guy who was so much bigger than me was not the fact that I could take him, but the catcher's son was on that team, and he was our biggest guy, and he was, he was built. He was strong. He was tough. And there were 10 or 15 other guys there as well. I knew they had my back. I got one shove in, and the rest came in. It made me real brave because I was not alone. But we're all going after much bigger adversaries these days, aren't we? I've been handling some dangerous stuff lately, uh, some tough conversations and challenging leadership issues, but I'm not handling any of that myself. There are a number of people who assure me, they pray for me every day, and I can't tell you, I, don't, I get it. I don't deserve that, though. But I love it because these people and others are standing up for me. It makes a huge difference in my world. It gives me courage, gives me wisdom, gives me hope, and it protects me. Who's watching your back right now? Whose back are you watching? Ecclesiastes 4, if one person falls, another can reach out and help. But people who are alone, when they fall, are in real trouble. Be sure you're in a group where others can watch out for you. Real quickly, I need others to walk with me, to work with me, to watch out for me. I need others to wait and weep with me. I'm real sensitive about this in our church because I can't wait and weep with everybody. Rod can, he, we try our best. But there are situations in life where no one should ever have to go through them alone. No one should have to sit alone in a hospital during a, a life or death surgery of a loved one. No woman should have to wait alone while she's waiting for a lab test from a problem pregnancy. No one should have to wait for the news from the battlefield alone. No one should have to wait to have to sit alone waiting for the medical examiner to sign off on the death certificate of the person who just had a heart attack in your home. Shouldn't have to be there alone. No one should ever have to stand at a graveside alone. No one should ever have to spend the first night alone when his wife or her husband dies. And no woman or man should have to spend the night alone when their wife or husband walks out. We go on and on. We're not meant to face the crises of life alone. God says that the safety net that, that he's planned is for our lives as a small group of believers who are committed to helping you. You should, it says in First Peter, be like one big family, full of sympathy toward each other loving one another with tender hearts. First Corinthians 12, if one member suffers again, all will suffer together. Community is God's answer to despair. The Bible says be happy with those who are happy, weep with those who weep. Encourage each other and strengthen each other. And there's one other reason, all these we're gonna be talking about in the days ahead, that we need people in our life, and it's this. I need others to witness with me 
to share the gospel with me, to extend the kingdom of others with me. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples, it says in John 13. Your love, not just for him, but for each other. It's so powerful. Is there anybody going to be in heaven because of you? I want to guarantee you something. If you will get in a small group for just these six weeks, we'll give you invitation cards to invite others. So if we do that, you bring people to see this little video we're going to show, have the discussion. You will have an opportunity to invite a neighbor or a friend who doesn't know God. And they will hear the gospel. And maybe, just maybe, with the power of God infused into your group, into your life, an eternity could change. Because people will know God. And there's no reason to be afraid of that. So we're going to do that together. Would you pray with me? Father, with all the things that have been happening in our world, over the last few years. It's pretty clear that it's time for the church to really be the church. It's time for a revolution of love and fellowship and community to move forward. With all my heart, Father, I believe we're supposed to raise the level of love we have for each other in this body and raise the level of community that people experience from this corner of the city. Have your way in us. Move in us. Father, forgive us for those times when we feel we didn't, uh, it was okay not to have other people in our lives. Help us say, I want to be part of a church that represents you. I want to experience and offer real community. I want to open my life to you, Father. I want to go beyond superficial relationships. And the final place we recognize just how much is at stake. Help us in the formation of groups. Help us in the formation of some projects. Help us make good soup, whatever it might be. To do what we do in a way that expands our relationships and expands your love and your grace. And focuses on what is truly important in your kingdom's work. Bless us with that, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.